Um, well, welcome to um, B4 with Diane Wilkinson. I'd like to say just a few things about Diane, actually. As a, um, well, I'll be egotistical first and, and talk about me. For about 30 years, I've been a coach in, in karate and martial arts, uh, but also within business. Now, what's unusual and rather brilliant about Diane, if, if she won't get too sensitive or immodest of me saying this on her behalf, is she works with teams. And, and I think that's quite unusual because understanding the dynamics of a team uh, and your role within that team, particularly if you're leading it or even if you're just part of it or you're hoping to lead it, I think that's absolutely essential. And Diane's absolutely wonderful at that. And having experienced not just from a personal point of view, but also professional point of view, what she does and heard about what she does, I think this will be a really, really fantastic session. So thank you very much indeed for dialing in. Thank you, Diane, for sharing your expertise wisdom and genius with us and over to you. Thanks very much John and uh, welcome everybody. I can see some faces that I know very well. Uh, Alison, Claire, lovely to see you there. I, um, Jonathan, great to have you. We saw you initially and um, I did see a Judy. Judy, are you joining us? We can't... Um... And there's Maisie. Maisie, hi. We can just see a blue screen. So uh, a really warm welcome today. And by the way, if there any children in the background or dogs in the background, this is the new world we're living in. I'm very happy that they are there. Don't feel you have to turn your, your video off at all. Claire, I wonder where your three are. Have you um, hidden them downstairs somewhere? Well, I've come downstairs to make it slightly quieter. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. And can you tell me what you can see, John? It's logo. Fabulous, Lorna, I can hear you there. So we are talking about building a 10F spring of personal resilience. And those who know me may have heard about these 10Fs for a very long time. And what I decided was in this COVID time, I really, believed it would be valuable to put this out there in what is it that I use professionally with teams, but actually I do this myself on a daily basis, trying to build the spring of personal resilience. And we are also going to hear more about uh, in my family. So what are we going to cover? We are going to cover first where this 10F model started, and then we'll go through the 10 Fs connected to that story of where it started. And then finally, I'm simply going to ask all of you, would you like to interact and take part and discuss what perhaps your next step is in building your spring of personal resilience? So firstly, let's look at a definition. And I find this one really helpful in that it's the capacity to spring back from difficulties and have that toughness or that uh, tough skin. And what we're going to see now is how does this then connect to the 10F? And what I'd like to ask is, could you put your hands up, those of you who recognize that this is York University, one of the beautiful buildings of York University. Anybody else recognize that it's York? Ah, thank you, John. So it starts on a Saturday afternoon, three o'clock. I'm in Oxford at home and I get a phone call from York University from my youngest son, Christopher. And this is what he says. Mom, life's not worth living. Okay, Chris? Mm, life's not worth living. I go, Chris, where are you? Mum, I've just woken up. So just pause button. This is a true story. And the context is that two weeks prior to this Saturday afternoon, a relationship of nearly three years had broken up and Christopher hadn't seen the breakup coming. This was in his first term at York University. This is what I said to him. I said, Chris, yeah. I said, 
I'm going to give you 30 minutes, and I was being very South African mother here. I said, Chris, I want you to go and get something to eat, get something to drink, and find Charlie. And I said, you've got 30 minutes. Go now. Mm, okay. I said, goodbye, and I'm phoning you back in 30 minutes. Put the phone down. I will say, as a mother, it's probably the longest 30 minutes in my life. Knowing that actually he was very low, and I hadn't ever heard him talk to me like that before. The reality was that we had begun to learn about this 10F. 30 minutes later, I rang him back and I said, Chris, hi, how are you doing? Mum, I'm fine. I'm going, oh my goodness, what a relief. So I said, uh, Chris, have you had something to eat? He said, yes, Mum, I've had some lasagna. I knew he'd had 28 portions of lasagna in the deep freeze that he'd made and together we'd put them in the deep freeze. I said, Chris, have you found Charlie? He said, yes, mum, I'm sitting in the pub with Charlie. I said, Chris, have you had something to drink? Yes, mum, I've got a beer in my hand. I said, Christopher, beer isn't fluid, doesn't count as fluid. You know that beer counts as fun. He went, oh, all right, mum, cheers, and put the phone down. So this is the reality of a Saturday afternoon in my life. Let me take you further in terms of what is this? So this is the 10F spring of personal resilience that had over the years prior to this, slowly developed in our family. And actually I started learning it when my daughter, who now is 31, uh, when, I, when she was a tiny baby. And what I learned was that for me as a mother, Fluid was important, food was vital, and 40 winks or enough sleep was absolutely vital. What I also, uh, over time in life, have learnt and learnt that friends and family and having a connection daily with somebody in our close context was, was really important. So it could be a work colleague, it could be a friend or a family member. And also fitness, that some sort of fitness is vital. And hence me saying to Christopher, Christopher, go and find that lasagna, go and have some fluid. I knew he'd had 40 winks, I didn't have to worry about that. He'd just woken up at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. And I knew he needed to have connection with somebody. And Charlie is always a reliable, dependable friend from Oxford that went to York with him. So these actually are the first five essential elements of good self-care. One of the things I have been doing in the last year, well in fact two things, one is comparing this to an NHS model and also working with a psychiatrist here in um, who works at the Warnford and the John Radcliffe and comparing it with some work research that he's been doing and also a model he's got and so we've compared notes and there are huge similarities between them. But let's pause at this point and let's all consider a question and I will come to you in turn and ask what your answer is to this question. So in this COVID-19 world that we're living in, what for you would you say is your biggest challenge in personal resilience or self-care? So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I will now come to... Who would like to say first? What I wonder, Alison, would you like to say? And then what if we come to Jonathan and then Claire, who's now Mrs. Humphreys, Claire, I can see. Um, so Alison, would you like to say what for you is your biggest challenge in personal resilience or self-care? I think feeling that I'm doing something useful. Um, because I'm currently furloughed and although my days are very busy, right. am I actually doing something that's useful and productive and that um, makes a difference? Because in my career I'm quite used to doing that and now it's gone and I'm struggling with that. Yeah, so crucial, isn't it? Yeah. Jonathan, let's hear from you. What for you would you say is your biggest challenge in personal resilience or self-care? 
uh, <clears throat> running a business with um, uh, 15 salaries, um, all on furlough. Um, uh, and I'm the only one that isn't. Right. It's my business. <laughs> and um, feeling frustrated by that uh, and being constantly aware that the business may fail because my sales have fallen through the floor. Right, right. So, Jonathan, do you mind just telling us what I have heard from Lorna is that the name of your company is Green Unit, is that right? Yeah. What does Green Unit sell? Do you mind telling us? It just gives the context. Uh, we manufacture um, premium um, modular sustainable buildings. Uh, we're, a, we're, a, we're a manufacturing company. Right. So we manufacture these buildings in Oxfordshire um, and we deliver them to the client site virtually complete. I do remember, Jonathan, meeting you at Blenheim Palace. Aha, uh -huh. mm. yes. So thank you. Uh, hugely helpful to hear. So Claire, what about you? What for you is your biggest challenge? Uh, I think looking at these first five Fs, probably friends and family, it's definitely hard being, um, obviously I'm a family unit of five and that's lovely, but there's, it, it, the extended family is missing. Um, and I think outside of that, actually just finding some space um, of actually not having some immediate family around all the time. Sure, sure. And having some peace. And, Claire, is this your peace and quiet now, coming onto a webinar? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Judy and Maisie, I can't see you. Would you like to share, can, unmute, and then tell us what your biggest challenge is? You can say no if you want. Hi, Diane. Um, it's Maisie okay. speaking. Um, for me, I think the biggest challenge is actually getting more than six hours sleep. I managed to get four and then I hear, I hear the beautiful chorus of the birds, but I'd like to get past that and just, you know, get some sleep and also a bit like um, Mrs. Humphreys. Sorry to refer to you so formally, but that's a name that I can see. Um, uh, yeah, I yeah. think it's the um, extended family and friends. Uh, um not being able to celebrate things that have occurred in the last few weeks that sort of thing oh sure just so tough isn't it yeah but actually as you say that 40 winks or that sleep is one of the reasons why i i put it as number three is that so often if that's not there then the rest just uh, life doesn't easily fall into a, a good coherent pattern in the day yeah I don't know. I mean, I managed to have a good coherent pattern in the day. I just like to get past the six hours. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Do you, have you ever managed that or is that just part of your sleep pattern? I'm beginning to think it's part of my sleep pattern, but I thought I was past that, if you know what I mean. Yeah, sure. Um, I was working, um, having to leave really early in the morning and I had very long days. So that is probably still my body working through the process. Uh, of winding down from it, if you see what I mean. Sure. So Maisie, just an interesting, in my collaboration with um, uh, Dr. Digby Quested, his research that he's been doing is into the, and I'm still trying to get the paper, is into the use of melatonin and the uh, rhythms of our bodies, but he and his population has been seriously mentally ill people. So what's interesting is how this model and his model is used with people who are well. And I do believe there's a spectrum that all of us, um, there's a spectrum. It's not just we are or we aren't. If these aren't there, that we run the risk. But what's interesting was his research about sleep and uh, the rhythms and looking at the use of melatonin in that um, in that pattern yeah Judy would you like to I, we can just see you would you like to tell us what your biggest challenge is I think probably my biggest challenge is uh, being productive suddenly uh, having very few things outside the home um, there's a lot of time at home and I have vast numbers of tasks to do, but I'm not uh, getting through them as quickly as I would like. Yeah, 
yeah interesting that whole what do we achieve in in a day so thank you thanks for uh sharing in that let's have a look at where we're going to next and the can you see the 10 springs can you see focus everybody yes so uh, Alison and uh, Judy this actually comes back to part of what you were saying um, the focus is knowing what our essentially what our purpose is each day or over the longer term what our purpose is so for example if we are um, parents of young children then it's looking after small children if we're a parent of young children and got a job how on earth are you homeschooling and working at the same time on the other hand if retired and looking after elderly people or if we are running a company jonathan as you are and uh, so what is our focus? What is our purpose that gets us out of bed in the morning? And Alison, I was hearing you say with that change of focus, that um, with a shift being on furlough, that actually it's not perhaps quite as crystal clear as that. I call it the oomph to get me out of bed in the morning. And uh, I had a huge shock on the 21st of March when three months of work, uh, Jonathan, a bit like you, three months of work went whoosh to zero and uh, my Airbnb let went to zero. Uh, and I, I, the oomph that was getting me out of bed was to, because a client said, Diane, you're due to run a, a workshop for us. It was an NHS client in London uh, for 35 people face to face. And she said to me, can you run this online? And I said, yes of course I can run this online guess what I had never run a webinar in my life before so the oomph for me has been learning how to and then designing and delivering these webinars so having that focus I do believe is the number six after those first five essentials it really is important for us to know that and then after focus is forgiveness and I say this is uh, whoever we are in the world, where, wherever we are on the faith spectrum or not, that actually, I use Nelson Mandela as an illustration here, that after 27 years in jail, he was able to forgive and not have an ounce of bitterness in him. Now, I'm not convinced I could do that after 20, if I was in jail for 27 years. But I love that that beautiful example that he has given us. And I do believe that if we aren't able, and this is forgiving ourselves as well as others, if we aren't able to do that, that actually we're the ones that lose out and the bitterness just eats up inside of us and, uh, and can uh, fester and isn't helpful. And then there's physical, and I'm saying it very clearly with an F, I've had some feedback from people going, this isn't 10 Fs, Diane. I'm going, it sounds like 10 Fs. Uh, so this is, I'm using the, the um, rule of a bit of uh, room for error here. Physical, whether we are in a care home and perhaps, which we know is not easily possible in this COVID time, but in non-COVID time, that actually elderly people need a hug or a, um, I used to take my dog in to visit a friend's uh, mum and she would be stroking the Rex, my dog. So we all need physical touch and it's a basic human need of ours. And if we're in a relationship that uh, is a, can be the sexual relationship as well. So again, each of these have a spectrum of um, what the definition is of them and and I say to people let's not let's not get hung up on the finer detail of the definition let's look at these 10 as they weave into the spring together and who are we and where are we in in our lives and how can we get physical touch and what's important for us in that and then, those who know me well, I couldn't possibly have 10 Fs without an F for fun. And uh, having some fun, be it at a dinner party or be it uh, now, my fun is having Zoom drinks in the, uh, in the evening. And uh, or 
yeah, working out what is that fun. And then finally, the, the last one, which is two words, again, um, slightly different to the others, is forever learning. And in the comparison that I did with the NHS model, what, what I found from that one is that it said we need, as human beings, we have a need to be creative. And, and if we are not learning things, that um, the risk is that we could also be getting low. And um, so then, because uh, this used to be the 9F model of um, spring of personal resilience, and I added that one, I felt it was hugely important and valuable that forever learning, um, wherever we are in the spectrum of life, that to be forever learning something is hugely important. So, I'm going to pause and ask another question to you. And the final question of today is in building your spring of personal resilience, what is your next step? Also, are there any comments or questions you want about this? By all means, do ask any questions that you would like. And be aware, I have got another uh, 21X on my phone because um, colleagues and clients and friends that know me well say, Diane, you've got to have this F in the model. So you, so by all means suggest it and we can see if, the, if it will pass the test, but it might have to be pass a very strict test to get to the 11F model. So in your building your spring of personal resilience, what's your next step perhaps, or any comments and questions about resilience? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, do you think that you need to do these in order? Is it like the hierarchy of need where if you don't have them in order, you can't move on to the next one? Yeah. So, Claire, I do believe. So if we look at because pe some people have said, oh, this is simply Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes, it is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But what I've taken is the first one which is our physiological needs and broken it up into that fluid food, 40 winks, friends and family and fitness. So much more tangible. And uh, Claire, I do, I do believe that the order of the first, probably six, is, is vital. And however, in working with clients and myself, what I often ask when, when we've got more time, I run half day, full day workshops on this, is what for you is the most challenging? So Maisie, hearing what you were saying about sleep, I also say what for you is the easiest in these and what for you is the most challenging? So yes, I think order is important, but some people might just say, well, fluid and food is easy and fitness is easy for me, but actually I struggle to make connection with people. I prefer to just uh, be working or sitting on my laptop, some of my adult children sitting on their laptop watching movies prior to COVID. So Claire, yes, however, I think it's important that we recognize difference between all of us, yeah. Any other questions? And just if you pop yourself off mute and then we can. Diane, may, may I ask a question, Diane? Of course, John, I'd love to hear. Thank you ever so much. That was wonderful, by the way. With regard to forever learning, um, and I, and I I, I'm looking at you, Jonathan, because I, I felt everything that you said earlier in terms of what I'm experiencing, even, even as the chairman. Um, with forever learning, I often have um, sort of a paradoxical thought about whether I should be learning new skills for my business or whether I should be learning um, things that are more recreational just for my own mental health, because I'm in the very fortunate situation of having two two student daughters back at home. So home life is wonderful because we never thought we'd spend this much time together ever again. <laughs> but in terms of focusing on the business and ensuring that we, we keep going, yeah. um, on the one hand, yes, yeah. I should be learning more and more and more about this. But actually, part of me thinks, well, I'd really like to go back and learn more Latin or yeah. learn Russian again, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, which at this time seems utterly sort of pointless. So it was, it was how do I... How do I get my opposable mind together on that one? So John, I absolutely believe that that learning 
uh, art of business is so vital. So Latin, and I'm sure Alison might uh, agree with you. I actually agree with you. I think Latin is fab. I'm a real Latin fan. And also, you were saying about your um, prior to that you are a black belt. Indeed, I am. I'm always cautious in saying the the uh, name of the. So you're a black belt in karate. Um, karate. Was it karate? I'm aware there are many different schools, and I don't want to get the. So uh, I do believe. Am I right that what you bring from your black belt, the discipline of karate, you bring that into your business? Would not, you not on the credit control side, honestly, everyone. That, that's not that's not an issue. No, in terms of focus and in terms yeah. of fitness and in terms of resilience, yes. So, John, I do believe that, um, and often when I'm coaching people one-to-one, I say, would you mind if we explore who you are out of work? We're going to be discussing work issues, but let me understand who you are out of work and what's important to you so that often we may use an analogy. So, for example, I might use an analogy and ask you what's the equivalent in your karate and in being a black belt, yeah. Alison, were you going to comment? Yeah, it's really, it really is a comment rather than a question, but maybe it's, it's not. Um, at the moment, none of us know where this whole virus thing is going. None of us can really have an end plan and know when or how it's going to play out. And therefore, we're not in control of that, which is also a struggle. But whilst we might feel that we've met the hygiene level, the five essentials on yeah. one day, the next day, those doubts and those issues and those problems might become more prevalent. And I, I'm thinking particularly Jonathan here, you know, from day to day, the rest of us are worrying about the sort of esoteric side of it, but actually Jonathan's dealing with harsh realities day to day. So we fluctuate as to where we are on this, if you, if you want to call it a hierarchy. Some days you're up at the, yes, I'd like to have more self-worth. Other days you're back down to the, oh my goodness, I'm be on the fundamentals here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Alison, to add to that, what I often say in my very, those who know me well, in my South African way, is that the first five are non-negotiable. And that we absolutely need those. And uh, so for example, a number of years ago in a low period of my life, I had a friend who said, Diane, I want you to meet me at quarter past seven every morning uh, and let's go to uni parks. So what I was getting through that was actually, it was a reason to roll out of bed other than my work. I was meeting up with friends and family and I was getting fitness and the discipline of her saying to me, come and fetch me, please, helped me when I was really low to get out of bed and whether I, I didn't ask myself in bed, oh, do I feel like picking up Anne? It wasn't, that wasn't in the equation. It was, Anne was waiting for me five days a week. So that's why I often say those first five are non-negotiable for us to have a healthy mental attitude. And then the self-worth, when those are solidly, in, well, not solidly, when we pay attention to those daily, it's easier for us to get the self-worth um, and for that to follow. When those, any of those first five are out of kilter, then often the next level leading up to self-worth can be, it's far more likely that it'll be missing. Any other, so a final comment from everybody. What's your takeaway from today? I could just add one thing. I can't put an F to it though. Oh, tell us, (laughs) yes. Um, uh, But uh, I I do, uh, I don't want to, appear like a do-gooder by saying this, but yeah. I do think uh, those 10 things are all about us. So it, it, it's quite um, self-centric. Yeah. But I do think that doing things for other people yes. is, is not only societally a, you know, a very good thing, of course. And I think we've all been motivated to do more these past seven or eight weeks uh, for others, but 
uh, I think it's, it's also very wholesome for ourselves to be engaged with others. And I couldn't quite see where that would fit into your, your spring of 10. Yeah, and so Jonathan, thank you, is that, and is that... hugely valuable. Yeah. And in the NHS one, they've got that, that you're doing mm -hmm. something for others. And, and I, so I've wrestled, and I do believe that it, it uh, perhaps could fit into the focus, that's why, but it's, it's not as clearly there as it is in the NHS. I mean, I do, I do understand, I do understand. I mean, the analogy I've often thought about is, um, you know, you're in the aircraft and uh, uh, you're being told to always secure yourself into your seat first if there's um, a disaster ahead uh, before you can help others. So it's important to get yourself in a position to be able to do that. But I would say number 11 should feature something for someone else. Hmm. Could it be philanthropy? Oh, another PH. Thank you. <laughs> If there, if, if there is money sloshing about, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, Judy, Maisie, Claire, do you want to say what your takeaway is? One or two words? Uh, I think the fun. Life isn't feeling especially fun in the Humphreys house, so that's one thing I might work on. <laughs> ah, fabulous, Claire. Look forward to hearing what that fun is, yeah. And uh, Judy, what for you? So during lockdown, I have uh, given some more uh, attention to the forever learning um, uh, category. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to be disciplined uh, to do something uh, on a regular basis and have uh, set, you know, written a little chart in my notebook to make sure that I tick off when I've done it so I can uh, monitor performance but um, <laughs> I, I think I think that that whole idea of learning being creative um, is is something uh, really to uh, keep keep well in sight um, and that also perhaps can touch on things like fun um, as well. Fabulous thanks Judy. So Maisie and then finally from Alison if there's anything you'd like to add as your takeaway. Maisie? I think I need to work on number four because I'm pretty good a bit like your children sit in front of a laptop and getting on with stuff because it's got to be done. Sure. Um, but I do communicate with people but not as perhaps much as I could and I, I think it's something I need to work on. Mm. Thanks, Maisie. And Maisie, the beautiful is, thing of this model, it's an, uh, there is an order, but it really is up to each of us to just recognise what are we good at doing, what's easy for us, and what's more challenging, and for us to, to use it as a tool rather than be constrained by it. Yeah. Final word from Alison, and then John is going to close the session today. Alison? Again, I'm going to contrive an F out of this one. <laughs> yes. I think find the time to be grateful, to actually look around and think, actually, I'm really fortunate. Oh. And mm. it's a bit mindful, isn't it? But <clears throat> then, yeah, finding time to actually see what's positive going on at the moment. Lovely. I'm going to add that to my 21. It'll be 22 <laughs> Fs. And uh, Jonathan, yours as well. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, John, over to you. Thank you. Ooh, ooh, hang on. Am I on? Yes. Am on. Um, we have had um, something through on our chat, which is feeling for others or empathy, oh. which I think is uh, very important as well. And if I may be slightly patriarchal with apologies, um, there's a fellowship, isn't there? We are all in this together to some degree. And even the network we've developed today might be useful to share ideas and thoughts, etc. So thank you very, very much indeed, Dan. I think that's absolutely wonderful. It reminds me of all the sort of cognitive behavioral therapy stuff that the NHS fo focuses on as well in terms of our resilience is about, um, is it Marcus Aurelius? Correct me if I'm, if, you know, we can't control the things that happen to us, but we can control how we feel about them and how we interpret them. And I think that's, that's one of the things I've pulled out from, from your talk today. So thank you everyone for contributing. Thank you, Diane, for sharing your wisdom as ever and look forward to connecting and seeing you all again soon and stay safe, healthy, and look forward to a better tomorrow. May not be tomorrow, but so, I mean that in a sort of, you know, in a general sense. <laughs>
but thank you all very much indeed thank you diane